tuned now for Village in Motion as we introduce Jane Curtis, who has some information you may be interested in. Jane? Aha! Good morning. We're going to a very far away place this morning. We start out there and we expand, contract and all that. Um, on the table in front of me here are some things made of felt. And these things come from Outer Mongolia. Outer Mongolia. So we're going to talk about a country that was, uh, of course, it's part of China at this point, but it, it goes back a long time into the BC, the people in that area. Unfortunately, at the moment, the Uyghurs, one of the tribes in the area, are re really not being treated very well, apparently, by the by the Chinese. It's a place it's that very few in, of us have ever been. In to. the news, yeah. <laughs> But this one, I've never been there, but a friend of mine was there, and she brought me these when she came back. Now, if we can see uh, the first map, please, we'll get an idea of what we're talking about. The actual, the uh, Mongol Empire, the Mongolian Empire, uh, is uh, of great extent. Um, you can see a from, 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 from the, the map right there, there. Yeah. you can see from the map, the, all that red area is uh, the, where the Mongol Empire expanded to, uh, and it, it is, uh, you can see, goes from the Pacific Ocean in the east back to Europe on the other side. And this represents, uh, it all happened in, in less well, within the 1200s, within the 13th century, the expansion occurred. Uh, the, I think uh, perhaps I'll start out by talking about some of the rulers. We'll see who they all were, and we will expand from there and look and talk about some of the uh, striking aspects, the important, the interesting, colorful aspects of it. Uh, let's look at one more map before we continue. This one looks downright predatory, I think. It looks almost like a grasshopper attacking the oh, left. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see again uh, uh, very, very colorfully here. It took in uh, all of what's now China. Uh, Tibet was part of it. Afghanistan, most of Afghanistan. And the, the entire uh, Middle East and Near East, it got to the shores of the Mediterranean. For a time, it was in Syria, where it, it clashed with the Crusaders. At, but you can see then, uh, in Europe, as it went westward and westward, it was as far as North Germany. It occupied Hungary, most of Poland. So it was an enormous empire. It had, I think it was, it was 9 million uh, square miles. And the Russian Empire later on, uh, inherited a lot of that, minus some of the southern things mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. But it holds the records for being the greatest one in, in extent in the whole world. And they really administered it, too. They, uh, they, they owned and possessed and, and used it. Uh, the next picture will show us, please. This is a drawing, of course, of Genghis Khan. Uh, his real name would have been pronounced Genghis Khan, but we're just going to say Genghis Khan because mm -hmm. it's 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 a more our ear is more used to it. He was born in in the 1150s to one of the nomadic tribes in the region there, and his family had been uh, sort of uh, ostracized from the center for one reason or another. His father's clan had. But they were they worked their way back into uh, into circulation. Uh, his father took the young man when he was very young, fifteen or something like that, to another tribe, and they were going to um, celebrate the betrothal of the boy to the princess of that clan, uh, which they did. And in those days, the man went to the woman's tribe. Uh -huh and lived with them for a while, got used to their ways, learned their speech if it was any different. Sounds like some of the African tribes and some of the Native American tribes. But he was um, uh, engaged to this, this lady. Uh, her name was Berta. And they did then 
a few years later, Mary, and he was interested in, in getting some of these clans together to get up a little strength. What happened was that, that he did in, uh, I believe it was 1206, he succeeded in uniting most of the tribes. There were still a few others. Uh, but his wife, at any rate, his new wife, was captured by somebody from one of the other tribes. And as was the custom then, of course, the, the, the winner just took everything over. Yeah. And they, they were still nomadic people. They moved around. And I guess they could assemble and disassemble a yurt and some of the, just in record time, they right. could move a whole encampment. Um, but they, uh, uh, she was captured. Berta was captured by the one one of the rival things that hadn't yet joined his his group. Uh, and several months later, she nine months later, she produced a baby, and they they never knew exactly uh, who the father of the baby was. Mm -hmm. But that didn't bother Genghis Khan at all, the young man. Uh, they, they named him uh, Jochid, uh, but I wanted to read something right at the beginning. All these rough and tumble and cruel things uh, were not the only aspect of their society. Uh, they were good administrators, but on the artistic side, we're not going to say a lot more about it, but they, uh, the Persians went over to them right from the very start, and the Persians were in a high level of artistic development. Mm. So a lot of these pictures look distinctly Persian, Persian. These, these drawings. Mm -hmm. But there's a passage in the Chronicle. A lot of the source of our information on this was a chronicle that was discovered um, a few years after Genghis Khan's death, which would have meant around the 1230s. And this was, it was called The Secret History uh, of the Mongols. And it was not exactly secret, except that it was uh, limited to that, to that thing. They, they didn't publicize it all over the place. Mm -hmm. But with regard to this, uh, to the birth of, of uh, Joshid, this is, is a lovely poem. And it can, comes in this chronicle, and it says, uh, it happened. Uh, it happened at a time when men were fighting. It happened at a time when men were killing. It happened at a time when the starry sky twisted in heaven, when the nation twisted in turmoil, when people could not rest in their bed or birds in their nest. Now this is a very poetic, mm -hmm. but what they're saying, his, his view of it was, it didn't matter. He knew who the mother was and that was important. And it, if the child developed fine, and he did. He developed into one of his best generals. But. Uh, Genghis began right away expanding. Uh, I took over the date usually given as 1206 when he had a good union, not quite all the clans, but most of them. Uh, a few years later, he moved eastward. Uh, he did an end run around the Great Wall of China and conquered North China, to put it, in, put it briefly. Uh, he did, he left as became their habit, he left a local leader, uh, a garrison, and enough enough people to, you know, to hold the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and away he went back to central Mongolia. This was in the Tarim Basin there, right, pretty much in the middle, the old tribal areas where they roamed around seasonally for their their true their their flocks. But he went back, and a few years later, he burst out to the west. And you wonder where, where they got enough people to do this, this small tribe. Uh, well, they did expand well. They, their birth rate was, was pretty good. But they were extremely efficient. Uh, as they moved west and south, and big distances, uh, Persia, uh, they were on the fringes of the, of the Russian regions there to the west. And of course, in the north, there was kind of a never, never land, the far north. But they, uh, they were very efficient warriors. We would look in a little while and see some of that. They uh, had a policy of approaching a country that they wanted to take, or a, a region, a tribe, and saying, if you surrender, become part of us be under our sovereignty. Fine, you know, mm -hmm. peace be unto you. 
they'd leave a, a leader and a garrison and on they'd go. But if they didn't, they'd be destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, really pretty utterly destroyed. The, any, any settlements they had, of course the Mongols themselves didn't have big cities, they still were nomads, but the others did have, have cities and with romantic names nowadays. Uh, but they uh, instilled a fear into these people. One of the tribes, in fact, was the uh, Tatars, who didn't, didn't uh, come under their sway until later, but they were very, very cruel. But, uh, once they'd established their point and ruled the thing, uh, they, they were strict, but they, they, stopped, they stopped the really, really gross things. Uh, but the Tartars were what the Europeans called all of them then after a while, because Tartar, uh, the connection uh, was with Tartarus, which was an old word for hell. Mm. Uh, so a okay. lot of things, be, we wonder why, oh, why do they call them the Tartars, you know, Tartar on your teeth or, no, it wasn't that, it was that this, this one group of people. Uh, well, he expanded wonderfully by about 1220, 1219 or 20 or so, uh, they had buttoned up that entire, remember that huge area we saw there? They buttoned that up, they'd been south, uh, they, they were, were making feints into other areas and cooks eventually took them over. And in, tw in 1227, uh, Jenkins died. He was, he was uh, thrown from a horse, which was highly unusual mm -hmm. for these people because right. horses and sheep were their, were their life. They didn't have many fresh vegetables and all that, but right. they had a strong protein diet and a, uh, this, a rough climate. They were used to just about anything. But he was at any rate believed to, he was known to have been thrown from a horse, and it is believed that he had internal injuries which were never mm -hmm. uh, recognized, of course, and never treated, right. uh, and he died. And this again established the later custom. Something called the Akuriltai was held. It was a grand meeting of all of the royal family, so to speak, those who would have a right to a voice in the successor. Now, he, his eldest son was this Jochi, uh, whose birth was a little indeterminate, mm -hmm. and Genghis himself didn't care, but other people did. And sons number two and three uh, disputed about that. Uh, and they decided finally that uh, the next one was gonna be declared great, great, con great Khan. That's what the Genghis, Genghis meant. His name was actually Timur, uh, uh, not Timur. Uh, well, anyway, he, he had he had a real name, and, and it just Genghis allegedly meant great greatest of all the Khans. So his it was his son Ogad Ogade who became the next Khan. Uh, Ogade was also a fighter. He, he, he do, he, both directions he expanded the empire, and he was a, a pretty good administrator. Now Genghis had made his daughters administrators of these territories. Mm. He sent the sons out to conquer them. The daughters became administrators and ran them, as it were. Well, Ogade then went into the eastern segment of the empire, and he had a lot, of, a lot more conquering in, in China. And then he went west, and they pushed the borders even farther. And they came into contact with the Kievan state you know, in, in Russia. Mm. Alexander Nevsky and, and the Teutonic Knights, they were, right. and they were certainly holding up their end. They were beating them. And one of the reasons why they won all the time, uh, of course they were horsemen par excellence, these tough little, little uh, what you might call it, wilderness horses. Right. Uh, but what, what they would do would be to attack the, for the front line of the enemy. They would shoot for the horses. Mm and then these heavily armored knights would be put onto the ground, dumped onto the ground, and if that didn't finish them, then of course they could just move in and let them have it sure. without even getting off their, their horses, their ponies. Uh, but then, then what they did after they had killed off the first round, they would turn tail, pretend to be fleeing, and many another, another soldier was caught in this trap. Baron von Richthofen, in fact, was, he was an uh, infantry officer, 
or a cavalry officer, but he, they would then turn around and they could turn in the saddle. They were twisted mm -hmm. practically from babyhood to turn around in the saddle and shoot backward. And the pursuers were just flattened yeah. when that happened. They used double bows. Uh, they, they're believed to have well, amongst the first, if not the first, the double bow had, had the two arches instead of just the one big one, and they could penetrate. They never could penetrate the Teutonic Knights' really heavy armor, but they could penetrate armor. And a lot of the Oriental armor was uh, padding. Mm. They used cloth, and that would absorb a good deal of it. Uh, they are believed to be the, in, the inventors, the originators of stirrups. Oh. Because unless, unless you could get your feet in the stirrups, mm -hmm. uh, you could not stand in the saddle and twist backward enough to fire back. Right. So you can see that they, they were very uh, uh, innovative. They were, they were clever people, in addition to being sturdy and strong. Uh, so Olga Day has a, a very successful reign. Uh, Olga Day dies, and when, when he died, they had to hold this Kurultai again and decide who would be his successor. Um, at this point, the uh, the line from from Genghis Khan's first son uh, had run out, and, or they weren't considering. There was one left, but they weren't considering him. So they went to another another branch of the family. So cousins sort of came into the act here, but we had someone named. Uh, Guyuk, Guyuk, and Guyuk, we have a picture, please. Oh, oh, that's that's Genghis Khan's wife, who was a very, very. Her name was Berta. He not only really cared for her, but she was very uh, efficient. And when he was away, of course, she was the the the, the word. Mm -hmm. She was the one. But another interesting one. It shows you the royal women seem to wear. Another picture will show us to this thing that stood up on the head, like that, and not no not not yet please not yet, uh, and she has decorations along the side, uh, but now the, the uh, I wanted to point out also that they're they're always uh, the, the similar features and I think this is not only that the same artists were doing it from India and from Persia, but they were uh, they really wore it sticking to the core of the tribe in their rulers and their leaders. So now please the next one. Uh, this was Ogade, and he looks a bit fierce, this second one. Uh, it looks a little bit Chinesey mm -hmm. there, and you begin to see more and more of that in the, the whiskers. But he's wearing his, uh, this typical Mongol, this cap, they just wear caps with big flaps. In fact, I think they still do in some places. But these were smaller. Now, Ogade's son was Guyuk, and he will be our next picture. Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, we have pictures of other of the queens, and this is the only one I could find. I know it includes his wife, and I know it includes uh, two of the other wives. I don't know who was who, but I'm showing it because you see, for one thing, the color, uh, dry climate. Maybe they, their natural color that they had available was mostly in those, in those shades. Mm -hmm. But you see desert shades in our country, and the Indians there tended to be these orange and mm -hmm. red and warm, very warm colors. But it was some sort of mark of, of uh, the, the tall thing was some sort of mark of, and the, they wore badges. There was a badge on it like a pin, uh, and that was a, uh, a ticket of office, so oh. to speak, mm -hmm. uh, like like your uh, oh, like your card or whatever you showed. Yeah, now please, uh, this is Guyuk. And Guyuk was a known as a, a playboy, pretty spoiled brat. He was quite young. Uh, his mother served as region, regent while the uh, Kurultai decided which. One would be next, and they decided on him. And his mo mother, Ogle, or uh, Tera 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 Mina, was also a woman of not to be trifled with. Uh, but he ruled only for two years. He was 
uh, holy terror. He went on to do a lot more conquering, and he was uh, not uh, not one of the nicer, not one of the less uh, efficient and aggressive types. But he did expand the empire a little more in that. But he uh, he died, as you say, and the question arose again: uh, Who would be next? And he had three brothers, and the oldest of the brothers was uh, uh, Munka. His name was Munka, and Munka became Khan, and went out to the westernmost reaches of it. By that time, they had reached Europe, the, the, the Near East and Europe. Uh, when when Ogadai had had died, you see, they had had this coral tie, and they had had to choose another one. So this became a habit. And wherever the people were in the royal family, wherever these conquerors, who were also called Khan, it meant leader, but the top one was the, you know, was Again, the, the, great, the great Khan, yeah, had Chinese names for it. Uh, so they all had to go back, but he was the one that they, that they chose for that. Now, he, I believe he was the one who expanded to Korea uh, the one who did not do as much in China, but he was also for the, the luxury. And he tried to come in that direction uh, and didn't get, get quite as far. But the next one in line was not one, they didn't even consider him, but then the third one was Kublai. And everybody's heard of Kublai Khan. So he was a, he was a very famous one, you know, and then the poem, Kublai Khan, mm -hmm. in, in, what, in, in something or other, did Kublai Khan uh, a stately pleasure dome decree. Uh, we've all heard of him. Well, now, each, each one of these Khans had, these, these great Khans, had opened, tried to open windows with the West. Mm -hmm. They had all done things like, I think it was Mong Ke, in fact, who contacted the Pope and suggested that he might like to join the Mongol Empire. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he was all, all done up in official form and sent, sent away. Well, you, of course, he responded to these things. And there were a couple of people who'd gone out. Uh, the famous Prester John, who <coughs> was part legend, had originated there. But there, there were contacts, in other words, and uh, trade contacts. Uh, under Ogaday, in fact, that had, had begun. And the uh, Mongols had set up a wonderful uh, sort of glorified Pony Express. How in the world did they get from the Pacific Ocean back to the, to the Black Sea in the Mediterranean in, in any reasonable, in anything but a lifetime? Well, it was like a Pony Express because they had every 25, about every 25 miles, they had way stations for, and these little horses were sturdy. And you could ride hell for leather 25 miles, and then you'd have one of these, and another one would take over, mm -hmm. and of course, round the clock. And there were even runners. If anything happened with a, the horse couldn't get through for any reason, the runner could get to the next station. The run, runners had a, a, a rest stop every three miles. Mm -hmm. So there was always somebody ready and waiting to run on. And they did, did use uh, carrier pigeons to some extent. But carrier pigeons, of course, couldn't do it all. Right. Uh, they could carry the message that the, uh, the great Khan is dead. You know, come home and, and vote. Mm -hmm. But that's how they kept in touch. And in a remarkably short period of time, considering it was 6,000 miles, you could get from Hungary to, well, they didn't have to go quite to the Pacific coast, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could get back for the coral tie. Everybody went back to Karakoram, the thing that served as a capital for these things. Well, now, Kublai was thoroughly uh, Chineseified. He was, he became, was a Sino, Sinophile from the beginning, as most of them were. But if we move along now, we'll look at pictures. That is Meng Ke. And after, now, let, let's go back to him for just one second, if we can. Uh, Monk had uh, kind of average reign, a little expanding, holding the fort beautifully, uh, 
the administration, the system worked fine, the Silk Road was active, trade was good. Uh, Marco Polo and his father were on their way to China. And when he died, um, there was a little bit of a scuffle because one of his elder brothers, uh, Arik, who was an old traditionalist, he wanted to keep the empire centered in, in Karakoram, keep it centered in the old center points, stick to tribal customs, uh, live the uh, Marine Corps hardware training wife, <laughs> life. Uh, and uh, Kublai was just the other way. Well, Kublai beat him out. And so Arik, this, this was Arik, and he was a traditionalist. He had a, a goodly following, but Kublai, uh, the first of the Yuan empires, he became a whole dynasty in China. Uh, and he, he had a lot, much more force behind him, and he was a for forceful person. So that settled that. Well, now there he is. And Kublai, whatever these things are on the ears, I never could find out. But that seemed to be some sort of mark. You notice he's wearing a Chinese type cap. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have this folded over sort of uh, uh, lounging room bathrobe, the padded, heavy thing coming over. So he's thoroughly China. Now that, he, he comes later. We'll look at him in just a second. Uh, but Kublai built, uh, he established a capital near what's now Beijing and built a wonderful palace, he really did. And he had all kinds of artisans and artists uh, and he was uh, respected. He too tried for ties with the West, which didn't work too well uh, because the West wasn't, wasn't that close, but the trade did, that kept on, that flourished. Mm -hmm. Kublai had expanded the coast, the Pacific Ocean, of course, in, in China. He settled all that. Then he got the idea, we're going to go and conquer Japan. Oh, okay. Which was across a sizable piece of water. Mm -hmm. And Japan, feudal Japan in the 13th century, you had your samurai system operating. The Japanese are great warriors, mm -hmm. warrior ethic going on. Uh, well, Kublai tried. Uh, through, he was going to do a two-pronged thing, one down through Korea, which they'd occupied for some time, uh, and one up from Lower China. And they got there. Uh, China uh, was hot and wet and not so good for warriors, and we don't know if that affected it. But the ones in the north, I guess, were, were the better better warriors. But when they got across the water there to Japan, the Japanese, of course, knew they were coming. And the Japanese sent forces down. It was in central Japan. There's a lot of, you know, the smaller islands. Uh, Kyushu was there. Uh, but the, there was a typhoon, a terrible, we're almost terrible to the end here. Ty oh, there was a typhoon anyway, and he failed. He tried again, and he failed. And when, when he died, he died at a ripe old age, 1294. And this was his successor. This was Timur, his grandson. He was pretty famous. He lasted into the middle of the 1300s, 14th century, but the empire then collapsed into four parts. This is a yurt. This is where they lived. And they if you put these up. They had walls on the side, and then the top, the pole up the center and supports along the side, so a sort of wigwam, very related to the wigwam. This was what one was like in the inside. Um, this, this was perhaps a fancier one. You had that fencing going around. They didn't all have such a fancy garden fence, but they did, and you can see radiating out from the top. And top, of course, for a small amount of light, but for smoke cut out when, when they heated the place. This was a very, very early drawing of and you see the, the side walls on the yurts were not as high, and they looked much more like a teepee. Right. And there they are cooking on a stove. Uh, this shows the middle of a horse. This is a up close one of a Mongol warrior. You can see he's, he's in a red thing. He's facing around so he can shoot backward. 
and the horse's mane, the black, peers to the right, so he's on that horse. You don't see any legs, the horse is galloping. Mm -hmm. The next picture, and his, his quiver is there with his arrows, and here he is, and he's a, 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 a fighter. He's, again, the horses are going to the left, but he's shooting backward, completely backward, and he has this two-bowed, this, this double, this double uh, bow. So here they are besieging a town, city, somewhere, um, similar to what they would have done in China, but this is a, a Western one. And they, in, now back to that one for just a second, please. They, no, we, uh, we really are gonna have to close here. Oh, okay, well, they, they inherited all the siege mechanisms of 13th century Europe, so there they are. They had ships, <coughs> they mounted a fleet when they tried to conquer Japan, one more. This is Marco Polo, is <laughs> a younger man, and next is Marco Polo as an old man, when he finally written his story. <coughs> this is the, the uh, uh, paper money, and that, that's a shot of, of Genghis on, on, or of Kublai on the paper money. And one last one, I think I show a coin. They actually minted money, in, which would have been made somewhere in the West, maybe in the Georgian Republic or one of those. So they really had a lot of modern ideas. They did. They were forerunners, and they reflected some of the battle things, particularly from the ancient Egyptian empire. Mm -hmm. So they, they, were, they were a step in evolution. But then at the end of that, back down they went. Very yeah. remarkable phenomenon. Nobody ever, ever equaled yeah. that. Okay.